Crossroads Media. Basketball's back in town. Oh, it's Texas Joel Embiid's presence, and basketball matters again. It's a shame that we were robbed of the last two months, but it is what it is, and now it's time to go full throttle mode and see if we can make a miracle happen. Nick Foles outcompeted Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Anything can happen, damn it. Now, would I put a ton of money on it? No, not necessarily. It is absolutely a far shot. But I'm not really that afraid of the Indiana Pacers, of the Cleveland Cavaliers, of the Orlando Magic. Like, these teams are not filled with elite skill to the point where a Joel Embiid can't take them down in a series. Boston, different story. Milwaukee, I still wouldn't favor the Sixers, but they do have holes and they are a beatable bunch. Look, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that superstar, elite, ridiculous, fucking talented human beings like Joel Embiid change your ceiling significantly. And we got the big man back. And he looked good from a health level. Moving around, the big brace, being able to plan his foot, make some moves happen, the jumper, some passes were nice. I mean, he looked physically good. The fatigue part of it absolutely settled in. All right, huffing and puffing, hands on his knees. That's why they were trying to get him back out there so he could play a couple of regular season games before we get to the play-in stuff. I mean, that's just reality of it. That was always going to be the case, though, right? That's not surprising to me. I was already sort of aware that that was inevitable. It's more about what does his body look like from a basketball standpoint with his knee and him staying upright. And I have no issues with how that went. He's Pick it up, steals late in the game. Oh, man. And Nick Nurse set the tone with the way that he challenged a play just seconds into the action as Joel Embiid picked up a foul, which was a gross call by Tony Brothers, who goes and reviews it and puts this stupid little smile on his face. I wanted to backhand right off as he goes, yeah, the, the coach's challenge is, is wrong, and the Sixers get hit with the timeout. Now they lose. Shut up! Shut up! You suck! Guy sucks at his job. And B doesn't suck at his job, though. Kelly Oubre in the fourth quarter sure didn't suck at his job. Whoa. When he pulls these games out of his ass... It's fun as hell. A couple of good defensive stands by a lot of different guys. I mentioned Embiid, Oubre. How about Paul Reed? And then he takes it to the house with a monster slam. And you did this without Tyrese Maxey as well. So that's a significant difference of your roster. You know, I saw a good amount of nice passes between Kyle Lowry and Embiid. Then you flirted in some nice passes with Oubre and Embiid as well. It's going to take some time. Time. I don't know if they have enough time, quite frankly. I, I really don't. It's hard to win a championship when you have most of your roster intact over 82 regular season games to figure out Mojo, let alone right now. But um, when you have such a scary weapon like Joel Embiid is, anything is possible because when you touch the floor, you have arguably the best player on the floor every single night. You know, like Giannis, if you see the Bucks in a seven-game series, is Giannis better? Well, he does have the resume. He does have the championship. But let's not act like the Milwaukee Bucks are not vulnerable right now. And if you were going to rip Doc Rivers to shreds every second he was here and say the Sixers don't have a chance because of Doc, well, then the Milwaukee Bucks, with your philosophy, does not have a chance because they have Doc Rivers. So I'm just saying, you can't have it both ways. If he was severely holding the Sixers back in years past, then don't you think that he's going to severely hold back the Milwaukee Bucks as well? Now, maybe his version in Milwaukee is severely holding them back. They lose in the conference finals instead of getting to the NBA finals because, well, Boston is an absolute juggernaut. And think about the talent that Boston loses with Marcus Smart, and he was a big personality, and he sort of described that club, and you bring in Porzingis, 
this and you have Drew Holiday. That's a machine. And they didn't have to deal with any sort of process like we did. And now they're just an absolute machine that I am scared of. And there's nothing worse than watching the Boston Celtics be good at basketball. Yet, all I pretty much watch is the Boston Celtics be good at basketball. I can't even hate watch them. There's a lot of teams throughout the sports world where you you hate watching. Oh, I can't stand the Penguins, but I still watch them because Sidney Crosby's great at hockey. I, I, I can't watch Jason Tatum, even though he's good at basketball. I, I hate them. I hate them, especially when it's a home game. I could probably survive 48 minutes if I catch something on TNT and they're on the road. Maybe they're playing the Phoenix Suns. Maybe they're playing the Thunder. I don't know, but they're away from TD Garden then maybe I could but as soon as they go on a massive run and that crowd goes bonkers and you see the whole visual nothing irritates me more I mean I, I seriously mean that as much as I despise and I'm telling you I hate the Dallas Cowboys to death when they pan around Jerry's world and all it's close it's very 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 close okay let's make sure that's known very very close but for some reason and maybe here's the reason because the sixers are not on their level while the eagles powerhouse compared to the cowboys okay i've seen playoff success for the eagles the cowboys you can laugh at this as if the boston celtics have won many championships all right they're dealing with something similar to we do with the phillies where they date back to a long ass time ago with kevin garnett and with paul pierce and with rondo and with Doc rivers ironically enough just like we talk about jimmy rollins and jay Sutley and ryan howard so it's not as if they're closing the door but when you compare that to the Sixers, it's night and day. So the Eagles get their end of the bargain done way more consistently than the Cowboys do. Maybe that's playing a role. I don't know. Um, but I do know this. I want to stop hearing about Isaiah Joe. I mean, people act like Isaiah Joe is the second coming of Jesus Christ himself. Look, did they butcher a nice little player that can shoot the ball from three? Yeah. I mean, the guy averages less than 20 minutes a night and scores eight points a game. Can he shoot the three ball? Yes. Yes. Would that be a nice, valuable piece off your bench? Yes, absolutely it would be. But the way people talk about it is you lost Tyrese Maxey. Okay? It's like you lost Joel Embiid. It's a nice player, but if you are properly ran, and that's a wonderful question here, but if you are properly ran, I do think it is easy, easier, okay? It's an easy thing to ask to find a role player in the NBA. Go find a role player. The problem is you are hands tied behind your back because Tobias stinks, and that's limiting a lot on what you can do. And I know Tobias's contract's coming off the books, and there's been a lot of speculation about Paul George. Paul George just does not do it for me. All right, Paul George, five years ago, six years ago, maybe. Paul George now, this is probably not the conversation for today, but I don't know. It just doesn't hit me and... and and it doesn't make my expectations go through. The, does it make you better? Yes. Is it maximizing your Joel Embiid run? Because every time he's here, you got to try and put the best roster together and make a make a, a, a run happen. You have to do everything in your power to try your best. And Paul George might be the best due to the circumstances on where free agency is next year. Maybe. Maybe. But there's a part of me that, in a way... It's not exactly the same by any means, but in a way, in theory, it reminds me of the Tobias Harris thing, which is we have to do something. So we're going to give a lot of money to Tobias because Jimmy Butler is going to leave. We can't let that happen. So you put yourself in a bad situation because uh, you, you, you have to do something. I feel like Paul George is just doing something, but you also have to do it because if you don't have any other opportunities and Joel B needs to be happy and at least feels like he has a chance to compete. You got to do it. So it's a very difficult position to be in. But yeah, I mean, the Isaiah Joe thing just cracks me up. How many shots did he have at the end of the game to fire it up and let the Wells Fargo center leave extremely unhappy? Two? Nothing. One was an air ball. He gets the ball right back. Nothing. 
OKC had a couple of chances there at the end, and they weren't at full strength either, but it's still a really good, greasy win. It was a fun night of basketball. It's been a while since I've been truly sucked into an end of a game like that because, well, it's lost a little bit of the pop lately. So it's coming after Bryce Harper hits three home runs, including a grand slam, six RBI. You flip the channel over after the Phillies game ends, although I had both on at two screens at the same time because it's 2024 and that's what you do. But yeah, I mean, I saw Joel and B down the stretch. The energy in the building, the fun Sixers fan in me just got lost in the moment for a little bit of time there and it's been a while since the Sixers had that type of impact on my life where nothing else mattered you're soaking in the time you're looking at the score you're seeing what's going on here so you 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 just embrace the moment sorry my phone started going off and I got a bit distracted but yeah I mean you just get a little lost in the moment that happened to me last night with Joel Embiid let's take a moment though to laugh at Tobias Harris because Tobias Harris he's airballing shots he's firing it up as soon as he catches it huge brick it wasn't even oh Tobias what are we doing yo Toby stop stop Stop. Part of me actually appreciates the fact that he doesn't give a damn. All right, it doesn't matter to him if he should, if he shouldn't. It doesn't matter to him if the fans are going to boo him. He doesn't worry about the angst. He's not mad uh, about what some of the fans are going to say when he's backtracking and backpedaling on the defensive side of the floor because obviously he's going to miss his jumper. He just does it, right? <laughs> Awareness, please. Time management, please. That's all I asked for. (laughs) I was cringing big time. All right, let's take a listen to Joel Embiid after the game. This is Embiid talking about the recent time off from his knee surgery and how it affected his mental health. Thought it was pretty interesting. Now, this clip is just from a reporter who was standing there in the locker room, so you might hear some noise and you might hear some other guys getting undressed in the locker room and getting ready for it or whatever. Joel Embiid wears his DX Suck It t-shirt and has that on in the front, which is amazing. WrestleMania, baby, here we are. But anyway, here's Embiid. Decide what, what it was like to, to get to the point where you could come back today, make that decision, and then take the floor for the first time in a couple months. Um, it's not a good one. I'll tell you about this. Usually, um, when I have injuries, you know, I just you know, tell myself, uh, you know, move on, on to the next one, you know, get better, uh, and then fix it. But this one was, um, no, he took a toll mentally, um, you know, being depressed, and uh, it was not a good one. So, um, you know, still, still not where I'm supposed to be, especially mentally, but I just love to play. And love basketball, and I want to play, and, uh, you know, any any chance that I, that I can be out there, um, um, you know, I'm going to take it. Why did this one? Why did this one? I, I never understood the hate for Joel Embiid. Um, there's a lot of people in this town that say he stinks, he's never going to win, he's never going to do that. First off, he's one of the most skilled players in the NBA. You can't ask for anything more than that. When you are setting up a franchise and you ask what can the best possible option be for us to find a top three, top four player in the league, you, you have that, so that's number one. And he talks about what this did to him mentally, talking about de- being depressed. And you know what? It's because all he wants to do is exactly Exactly what we want. All we want is to win, right? As Sixers fans, we want a championship so bad and we are so hungry. And we have an athlete here who is top five in the sport, if not top three in this skill wise, based off of natural skill ability for a dude who picked up the game at 16, worked his way to MVP form and arguably top three in the sport, but skill wise has more skill than anybody in the damn sport outside of LeBron James, right? And he is just as hungry as we are, yet there's a portion of the fan base that hates him to another level because he hasn't won it yet. I I can't wrap my head around that. I don't settle in with those type of people. And the point that he's talking about right now is this man was playing at the best he's ever played. And by the way, he played at a point where he was the best in the league and it was the most valued in the league. So he's playing even better than that. He scores 70 plus points. He's going through this bad injury. 
He has to miss time, and it's keeping him down. He is depressed because of it. All right, this wasn't just a normal injury like he had in the past where he can just get by it and work and rehab. No, this one hurt him. This one hurt him more than any other one has because I think he realizes his capabilities, as you all should, the ones that hate him, you all should. This dude wants it just as bad. I mean, he's giving us everything. What I always talk about in regards to athletes and in regards to sports is failures happen, not winning a championship happen. Did Brian Dawkins win a championship here? No. Why is he loved? Did Allen Iverson win a championship here? No. Why was he loved? Because they just left it all out there and gave us everything. If Joel Embiid just gives us every ounce of blood, sweat, and tears on that floor at the Wells Fargo Center, I don't know what else I can do other than love the man, appreciate the man, and I, I, I demand him to play well. Game 7 is unacceptable, but there's a difference between reacting to Game 7 and how bad it was, and then this overall approach. I'm dealing with something right now similar with the Phillies. When I react to games here on Broads Media, it's night to night. So when Bryce Harper goes out for five, and I say that's not good, that's not good, I'm not talking about the overall Bryce Harper. I'm talking about that particular night. Game seven, Joel Embiid on the road, Boston Celtics, inexcusable, not good enough. That's the conversation of the night. The overall body of work of Joel Embiid is what more can you ask for? Same applies to Bryce. 0 for 5 one day, three home runs or grand slam the next day. Bryce is, is amazing. Bryce is one of the best baseball players ever. You have to be able to separate the two. The game seven, the playoff moments, we need more from Joel Embiid. That's okay to say. But we also have to respect Joel Embiid and his greatness and his determination and his hunger and his want-to and his will, just like you did with Allen Iverson, just like you did with Brian Dawkins. But I guess you pick and choose which guys you like because, while Donovan McNabb gets a certain treatment, although he was constantly getting you to NFC Championship games blindfolded but couldn't win the big one. Allen Iverson didn't win the big one. Well, his team wasn't good enough against that Lakers team. You're the same person that hated Doc Rivers and hated Tobias Harris because you you thought that they were both insanely overrated and one guy's paid so much that it's limiting your roster. See what I'm saying? You pick and choose when it works. I don't know. I find it a little bit odd. I just love the big man. I do. I truly love the big man and extremely happy that he's here and he's ours. And uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. I, I saw this labeled somewhere. Was it Kevin Kincaid of Crossing Broad? It might have been Kevin Kincaid of Crossing Broad. And I think at the end of his blog post, it said something along the lines of there's a couple of regular season games left, and he's excited to watch this team play with barely any expectations. It's hard for me not to grab any expectations because I want to win a championship. And maybe if I see them play a game in the playoffs, a play-in game, and they they whoop someone's ass, it's like, whoa, hold on a second. That's what the ceiling looks like again with Embiid now that Kyle Lowry's here in campaign and Tyrese Maxey's healthy, and you start to really envision what could be if they all play up to their standard. So maybe as we watch them progress as a unit in the very short amount of time they have left together – Maybe the expectations do grow into something because, well, you see excellence. But I do kind of like that approach right now based off the current situation they're in. No expectations. L- let it play out, but be excited to watch the big fella and see how he handles this level of adversity. I don't believe this, but I've just been sort of facetiously saying it throughout the year. Wouldn't it be so Sixers if this is the year they actually get out of the second round when nobody expects them to, when there's so much pressure to do it and everyone plays too tight, they grab the basketball too tight, they don't read the double teams properly, they're overthinking it, their their shots are off. Well, right now nobody believes in them. And they play that attitude, they play the hungry dogs run faster card and you see where they go from there. I mean, it would be Sixers if that was the case. Not put my money down on it. 
but it's just something that I feel deep down in my core. All right, let's run on over to the Anytime Hotline and hear from a couple of you here on the text board. Text board went off last night after the game. Hey, bros, I was at the game last night, and there was a different feeling walking into that place. Joel Embiid matters. Him returning is all it took, and now I'm back on board along with my entire family who I went to the game with. My sister, my mother, and my father. It was very fun ending. Tyrese Maxey wasn't even playing, and Embiid takes the game over. If you can't feel that through the entire city, I need you to check if you're breathing. I don't want to get my heart broken, so I'm not going to go too far out of control, but it's definitely fun to have the basketball team back again. It's been a rough two months. Hey! Oh, I almost dropped my coffee. Excellent, excellently said. Perfectly said. I think that's a hell of a text, and uh, that's awesome, man. You get to go to the game with your fam. I can't wait to take Brooklyn to the game when she gets a little older. Maybe we pop another one out. Maybe she has a sister. I don't know. And it's me, my wife, two kids. We're going to the game. They got their cute little Sixers outfits on. I, I can't wait. So when I read that, the father in me sort of smiled a tad because uh, I'm just I'm excited for those moments to be able to spend time with my family and do exactly what you did. I mean, go to a game, get to watch Joel Embiid. It's going to be great. But yeah, I mean, I, I understand because even in my own house, my own house had a different energy. So I can only imagine what it was like when there was 20,000 people going nuts for Matt Cord to go, uh, number 21 from Kansas Joel Embiid! You get the fire go. Yeah! Yeah! I was doing that in the living room with my dogs. So I can imagine what it was like walking into that place. Check out warm-ups. What's it going to be like? All the beat reporters had their phones out. Kyle Newbeck's going live on Instagram. A bunch of others are putting out video for, for jump shots with nobody defending him except for a coach that's maybe five feet from him and then someone else rebounding and passing him the ball just to take jump shots in, 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 in a gym format, open gym format, and, and we're googly eyes like we've, we're, we're witnessing the greatest thing ever, which we are. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's where we are here. We're obsessed with the man. That man holds the power of what this winter playoff run could be. It's amazing. All right, here's another text here. My question to you, Broats. Uh-oh. Can Kelly Oubre be reliable enough? No. That's my answer. But I will continue your text. Because if we are going to upset any team after the play-in round, he will have to be similar to that fourth quarter. Oh, jeez, I can't rely on that consistently. Here's more. It has to be done that way or else there's no shot because Tobias is not the answer. I can't stand him. I need this contract to end immediately. Is there any way we can ship him to the G League? <laughs> oh, man. Tobias is getting sent down to the G League by the text board. That's incredible stuff. To answer your question, can Kelly Oubre be reliable enough? How could I say anything other than no? He is what he is. Hey, if you get that effort in a game four where you can sweep the first round, close it out, it can ha And Look, uh, my point is, in seven games, can Kelly Oubre make an impact? It won't be that impact. It won't be the same way. But if I just put Kelly Oubre under the umbrella of impact or no impact, in seven games, he can make an impact in four of those. He could not make an impact in three. It could be flip-flopped and reversed very quickly, though, where he no-shows for four and makes an impact in three. But if that's the case, maybe you drop the series. That could be enough in you failing or not. So it depends on what Embiid does that night because, you know, unfortunately, you might get a Kelly Oubre wow game the same time you get a Joel Embiid wow game. What you need to have happen is it to fall in line, and you can't prepare for this. But if Embiid's getting double-teamed, the ball's leaving his hands, maybe he can contribute by getting a ton of assists. Maybe instead of 38, he has 25, but he also has 12 assists and 12 rebounds. So it's not the most elite scoring performance for Embiid. That's the night where Kelly Oubre is knocking down five three-pointers in nine attempts. But if he goes one for nine on that day when Embiid's passing out of the double team, and now it's a brick or it's an air ball or it's a shot that just rattles around, it goes around the rim, it's halfway down, it flies back over. Well, you need someone else to pick up that scoring because teams are are going to say anybody but Joel Embiid could beat us. 
So weirdly, it depends on what type of night everybody else is having, and you got to hope that it doesn't fall on a night when everyone else is cooking because then to a degree you sort of wasted one of those Kelly Oubre games. I know that sounds very odd, but that's sort of how my brain works and how it wraps uh, around this Kelly Oubre experience in a very strange way. All right, here's another one here. As great as the win against OKC was, it's not doing much for me. How many times will I overcommit to this organization just to be set up to fail? I can't do it to myself again. I don't see how Embiid returns from missing all this time, knee brace on, out of shape, and now it's championship mode. I will not be fooled. There's nothing I want more. I dream of a title in this town since Allen Iverson. The city deserves it. I just can't get there. I'm sorry, and I feel I'm letting everybody down. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it if you're talking about your inner circle, right? If your inner circle is relying on you to be the hype man or the hype woman, um, you know, then maybe, maybe. By the way, you guys can leave your name and where you're from in some of the texts just to create a little bit of a relationship. These ones I picked out did not have any names, but they were great texts, so I really thought they contributed to the conversation. But, you know, hey, Jim from South Philly or uh, Bill from New Jersey or whatever, just throwing it out there. By the way, since we're on a little side topic here, uh, we now have Coffee with Broads back in action Mondays and Thursday mornings at 11 a.m. And the way you get access to that is join the YouTube community page here for $4.99 a month. The information is down below in the description. We live stream Monday, Thursday mornings having our coffee together. And there's also access to our Discord channel as well. So if you want to factor that in too, I greatly appreciate it. You guys are the best, man. We've had some fun over the, the first few Coffee with Broads, and I can't wait to continue it. So just want to plug that in here. And yeah, I mean, when you say you're letting everybody down, I, I think there's a good portion of people that feel very similar to you because the timing is just very hard. It is. I mean, if we're just being honest and we remove the Sixers emotion for a second, it's hard to demand them to just be excellent with the lack of time and the lack of experience playing with one another. Not that it's impossible. It's just hard. It's harder. All right, and they've had difficult times throughout the past, but they never really had an easy. Sl well, I guess the, the Atlanta Hawks one was easy in theory before Ben Simmons did his whole thing. I don't know. That was an easy path. But you're always dealing with something. There's always an injury. There's always someone going down. Uh, there's always a big trade. So it's messing up the mojo. And you don't have a lot of time with that. Jimmy Butler's here. You don't have a lot of time. Tobias here. You don't have a lot of time. This happened. You don't have a lot of time. Timing's always been a problem. And here we go. Another one. More issues. But we'll see. Nick Nurse in play. So schematically, strategically, because you have a... Advantage in my eyes, essentially against every coach except for Spo. I mean, if you face off against Eric Spolstra, it's a different animal because he's the only one that fear. I don't. I don't fear Joe Mazzulla. Now, ultimately, the impact of a head coach is not as significant as the impact of the best players on the floor. But in regards to what an NBA head coach provides in a seven-game series, which is more than in regular season hoops. When you go back to the tape and you try different personnel groupings and you see how you can expose a mismatch and you see what the other team is bringing, how can we counter, you do have an advantage against almost every single coach except for one or two in the league. So maybe that's enough to help out with this lack of timing issue because you can get creative and try things that you weren't going to try in the past. All right, this coffee I'm holding because I need a sip badly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a sip. We're going to wrap the show up. Nothing like it. On a rainy day, a nice cup of black mud, perfection. Thank you guys all so much. I love you to death. Appreciate it. It's nice talking Sixers hoops again. We will be talking very soon, and I'll see you all on the next one.